Добро вечер, почитувано публико на телевизија Сонце, еве не со нова емисија од сериалот ТВ Интервју. Во вечерашна емисија ќе се обидеме да одговориме на неколку актуелни прашања, а во тоа ќе ни помогне нашиот гостин, нашиот стар пријател, господинот Сен Вакнин. Имавме неколку интервјуа со него, но кога се разговара со него, секогаш може да чуете аргументирани одговори, а тоа го барате и вие гледачите. Некои луѓе велат дека умните во Македонија не можат да дојдат до израз и затоа во оваа емисија ќе направиме обид, аргументирано, да дадеме одговор на оние прашања што ве, што ве мачат и вас и нас. Срдечен поздрав до гостинот во вечерашна емисија Сен Вакнин. Thank you for having me. Good evening. А Сен Вакнин е инаку аналитичар од светски ранг, добро ги согледува проблемите и донесува заклучоци кои потоа се реализираат во стварноста. Господине Вакнин, ќе почнеме со она прашање што е најгорливо во моментов, а тоа е бегалската криза. Бегалската криза се одвива од Запад од источните земји кон Европа. По кој пат е ова? Историјски the, гледано. The refugee crisis has just started. It will continue. There are 62.5 million refugees in the world, of which 10 million in the Middle East, more than 10 million in Africa, 20 million in Asia, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. These people are coming to Europe. Nothing can stop them. Not agreements, not tear gas, not military, not police. Nothing can stop this human wave. There is no way. No way to stop this human wave. What is happening right now is that the path, the path that the refugees have established over the last two years, which was through Turkey to Greece, through Macedonia to Serbia and so on, this path is being effectively blocked. The major contribution was from Macedonia. Macedonia blocked the path effectively. After Greece failed to block it, after the European Union failed to block it, after Italy failed to block its path and so on and so forth, the small country of Macedonia succeeded to block the path. Because the path has been blocked, asylum seeking applications in Germany fell last month by 60%. That means that the refugees are now looking for alternative paths. They will no longer use the Turkey, Greece, Macedonia path, but they will find alternative paths. They maybe will go through Libya. They maybe will attack now Italy. Maybe they will go through Bulgaria. Maybe even through Russia. But one thing is for sure. The refugees will keep coming, and they will keep finding paths, one after the other. Europe is widely open by design and by agreements and by treaties. Europe, to protect itself against these refugees, must transform its nature and its character. Instead of the European Union as it is today with the Schengen Agreement and so on and so forth, Europe must go back 50 years and must eliminate or reverse its various treaties and so on and must close its space like a castle or a fortress Will this happen? Maybe. And maybe not. Дали сте сигурен дека Европа ќе успе во таа замисла да се затвори како замок, како We have to look at history. There have been eight times that Europe has been invaded over the last 2000 years. There have been eight times that Europe has been invaded from the east. In none of these eight times did Europe succeed to defend itself. In all these invasions Europe was wide open and was essentially conquered by the invaders. Some of these invaders you know personally. They are called the Slavs. Се поставуваат некои рационални прашања. Ако бегалците бегаат од економски причини, од сиромаштие и така натаму, зошто не бегаат, односно не се населуваат во богатите и развиени арапски земји како што се Саудиска Арабија, Абу Даби и Обединети Арапски Емирати туку First of all, uh, there are two populations of uh, refugees. One group of refugees is coming from Pakistan and Afghanistan 
and these people are mostly economic migrants. And one group of refugees is coming from Syria and to some extent Iraq, where ISIS is taken over, and these people are escaping war. They are real refugees. They are real asylum seekers. So these are two separate groups, not connected to each other. The agreement with Turkey is that economic migrants, mainly from Pakistan and Afghanistan, will be returned to Turkey. But Syrian migrants will be accepted in Europe because these are two totally separate groups. That's point number one. Point number two is completely untrue that the rich Arab state did not take refugees. Saudi Arabia alone, in the last uh, four years, has taken 1.4 million Syrian refugees. Uh, the Gulf states have taken half a million Syrian refugees. Altogether, all the Gulf states, Kuwait, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth, have taken two million refugees. So why do we think that they are not taking refugees? Mm -hmm. The reason is because these countries did not sign the 1951 agreement, international treaty, for refugee status. In other words, they are not signatories to the UNHCR uh, treaty that established the status of refugee. When a Syrian refugee comes to Germany, the Syrian refugee is registered as a refugee. Mm -hmm. But then when a refugee comes to Saudi Arabia, it cannot by law be registered as refugee. Uh -huh. It is registered as a migrant mm -hmm. because Saudi Arabia did not sign the Treaty for Refugees. But the fact is that between 2011 and 2015, close to 2 million Syrians have, have moved as refugees from Syria to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar. And that's a big Siga, number. Now, a little scholastic question. If we remember that the high Commissariat for the United Nations was formed at the end of the First World War, when the world had about 25,000 6,000 Beggars, today, after so many years, there are millions of Beggars. What is the problem is that Комитет, високиот комесариат за бегалци на Обединетите нации, наместо да го намалува бројот на бегалците, го зголемува, го мултиплицира во милиони. No, the refugees, the number of refugees is, is not a consequence of the activities or lack of activities of any agency. It is a consequence of wars, economic dislocation, economic crisis, drug, uh, drug, uh, fight, drug related fighting, the rise of religious extremism, the collapse of, of the bipolar Cold War system of Russia balancing the United States, uh, the emergence of the United States as a totally destabilizing force on the global arena, the decline of, the, of Europe as a, as a superpower, as a global power. So there are many, many, many reasons why such a huge number of refugees has been created. Actually, today is the largest number of refugees in human history. Yeah. Ова што го спомнавте во предходниот одговор за тоа дека бегалскиот бран не може никој да го сопре. Дали тоа што се случи во неделата на 10-ти овој месец е резултат на тој бран дека е толку јак што на вистина ништо не може да го сопре кога на македонско и грчката граница беше разбиена, оградата мораше со завез да се употреби, имаше ранети и на едната и на другата страна. The only way to stop the human wave of refugees is to shoot them and to kill them and to put them in, the, in concentration camps and so on and so forth. If, yes, it's if the European Union wants to stop the waves, the forthcoming wave of refugees, it has to stop being the European Union and become a Nazi Union. It has to give up its values, it has to give up free movement of people, it has to give up human rights, it has to give up civil rights, and so on. The trap, the trap, the European Union, Europe is in a trap because they espoused and created values, they announced themselves as human, as, you know, open and this, society, yeah? this open society, open borders, open movement, open labor, open everything, and open societies invite visitors, invite guests, invite refugees. So the only way is to go back on all these announcements and also to become far less democratic societies because in democratic societies it's very, very difficult to implement such measures. Mm -hmm. NGOs, civil society, all these have to be suppressed. Free media has to be suppressed. 
the wave of refugees will do one of two. Or it will transform the character of Europe so that Europe is no longer white, no longer Christian, no longer democratic liberal, no longer feminist. It's one option. Or it will transform Europe into a totalitarian continent with no democracy, no human rights, no civil rights, no values, no openness, and so on. These are exactly the two options. Do you think that Europe has in itself the power to bring a decision between these two opposite options? I think the result will be number one. I think within 50 years, Europe will not be white or Christian or liberal democratic anymore. Mm -hmm. А ова што сега се случува донесе и некои несакани случки во Европа, Париз, Брисел, терористичките акти, сега се влеа таму страв меѓу населението, институциите се затворени во себе, сообраќајот е рестриктивно регулиран и така натаму. До каде ќе доведе таа ситуација? This has nothing to do with the refugees or the Middle East. The, all the participants in the attacks in Brussels and Paris, all of them were locals, local people. All of them were born in France or born in Belgium, educated in France, educated in Belgium, know the language, know the culture, participated in the culture. They were locals. They were locals of Muslim origin. And because they were of Muslim origin, they suffered all their life discrimination, they were not accepted in, in white society. Their unemployment among Muslims is seven times the unemployment among non-Muslims. They belong to a different culture by choice, and this culture is not acceptable to the liberal, democratic, feminist, advanced, progressive values of mm -hmm. Europe. So they are part of a ghetto of, of Muslims within Europe. This ghetto it has high, high unemployment, high poverty, high illiteracy, lack of education, lack of prospects, lack of jobs, and so on and so forth. This is a time bomb. But this time bomb is not connected to Middle East or any other outside developments. Do you think that there is no connection to these closed ghettos with the radical centers of the radical Islam? Of course there is a connection. These people go to fight in Syria. They join ISIS. They are inspired by ISIS. Mm -hmm. they, but before that, they were inspired by Al-Qaeda. And before that, they were inspired, inspired by Wahhabism from Saudi Arabia. And before that, they were inspired by Muslim Brotherhood. And yeah. before that, they were inspired by Hamas, and so on and so forth. They are looking to be inspired. Today it's ISIS, tomorrow it's something else. They are angry, very angry people. They don't have jobs. They don't have a future. They don't have education. They, they don't make money. They are not accepted, they are rejected, they are mocked, they are, they are so they hate. Дали мислите дека ова што сега се случува е всушност реванш освета на муслиманите од средниот и подалечниот исток, од близкиот и средниот исток за колониалниот период на европските земји кога таму биле тие огнетувачи сега им враќаат мило за драго? No, I don't think it's, uh, it's too removed from colonialism. Colonialism collapsed finally in the 1960s. That's 50 years ago. It is a result of the failure of local populations to establish functioning states, which is something that should be very familiar to you as a Macedonian. Mm -hmm. It is not so easy to have your own state. It is not so easy to run the state, to establish functioning institutions, to be mature, to know how to manage your affairs. And all these former colo colonies, when they became independent autonomous states, failed to establish states. So we have failed states. States that give no hope to their citizens, no jobs, no future, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no education, no functioning <laughs> institutions. So these people are coming where they are, where there is hope, where there are jobs, where there are functioning institutions. They are following the money. They are following the future, they are following, you know. Most of the Syrians who come to Europe don't want to be in Europe. They want to go back to Syria. They love their home, they love the environment, they love the culture. They feel very, very bad in Europe. But they have no choice. Da ve podsjetam deka v jedno intervju so poranešnjot izraelski ambasador v Makedonija Josija Mrani. 
Упостави прашање кое го извлеков од еден текст објавен во Ројтер. Дека муслиманите во светот се обединуваат по верска основа и се трудат да направат муслиманска нација во светот. Дали го делите тоа мислење? Дека муслиманите во светот одат да направат нација по верска основа. They don't have to try and they don't have, it is a basic fundament and tenet of Islam that all Muslims of the world belong to one nation, which is called Ummah. The, the Islamic Ummah is the nation of all Muslims wherever they are. The Islamic Ummah is much more important than one's citizenship. Mm -hmm. So you are first a Muslim, then you are German. You are first Muslim, then you are Egyptian. First, you're Muslim. You belong to the Ummah. Now, the Ummah is an invention of the 7th century. Immediately after the death of Muhammad, there was a series of four caliphs, four successors to Muhammad. And they gradually, especially Omar, Khalif Omar, they established the concept of Ummah. Ummah is both a religious concept, in other words, adherence to the to the tenets and, and commandments of Islam, to the mode of behavior of Islam, behaving as a Muslim, avoiding certain things like drinking and so on. So this is the religious aspect, but it also has definitely a political aspect, a state-like aspect, where Muslims everywhere should aspire to implement the Sharia, which is the Muslim law, both the civil Sharia and the criminal Sharia, as in Saudi Arabia, for example, and so on and so forth. So yes, there is a, there is a sort of perception that all Muslims belong to a super state. I wouldn't call it a state, but it's a super state. It's a super state that exists in the mind. It doesn't exist in reality. It's not a carpet or a, a, it's a state of mind of belonging to the super state. The radical Islam, radical Muslims, militant Muslims, they say, Umma is not a state of mind. Umma is a political reality. Mm -hmm. So we should translate the state of mind into political reality called Halifa. That's the difference between, mm -hmm. between moderate Muslims. Moderate Muslims say Umma is a state of mind. We should behave as Muslims. Da li toa takvo jedno diferenciranje na muslimanite od нација во умот да ја трансформираат во нација на територијата, нема да предизвика тектонски пореметувања во светот и некои реакции од другите, условно да кажеме, религии, христијанската и дали е католичка или право ортодоксна, се едно. Дали не постои некоја опас, латентна опасност од ре, контрареакција? Ди... Concept of the traditional concept of Umma in the 7th century and the 8th century and up to the 10th century, the traditional concept of Umma was political and territorial. Muslims conquered, conquered Persia and conquered Spain. They had the biggest empire in history. And that was the Umma. That was the so traditionally uh, Umma is territorial and political. Mm -hmm. ISIS are true Muslims. They go back to the original, authentic, fundamental Islam mm -hmm. as it existing, existed during Muhammad's time and much more after Muhammad died. So they, are really, they really represent Islam as it, as it was unchanged, untainted. Then history happened and now today Umar is considered to be a combination of state of mind and mode of behavior. Umar also means that you behave in a certain way. Now there's always been a backlash, always been a reaction by Christian states, for example, and Christian nations against Muslims. So we had um, Europe was invaded six times by Muslims. Muslims invaded Europe six times. And each of these times, there was a coalition of Christian kings and Christian states and so on and so forth, which fought back. Last time was in the 17th century when the Muslims almost conquered Vienna. But before that, you had Muslims in Spain, the Moors, and so on. There were several invasions, six invasions of, of uh, and I call what is happening today the seventh invasion. This is the seventh invasion. Dali ovaj sedmi obid za invazija će bide 
конечно успешен или повторно ќе бидат потиснати назад. It's already successful. Take into account that in Germany there are almost 6 million Muslims. 3 million Turks and 2 million non-Turks. Take into account that in uh, France about 15% of the population are Muslims. Moroccans, Algerians, North Africans. Take into account that in Switzerland 22% of the population are not Swiss. And so on and so forth. These are not small numbers, big numbers. If you plot the rate of reproduction, how many children, if you plot the rate of reproduction of Muslims against the rate of reproduction of Christians, by 2050, Muslims will become a majority. Во Европа, а? Во Европа. Oh, oh. So the invasion is, is already concluded, but it's an invasion without weapons, it's a peaceful invasion, it's an invasion which involves more culture war, it's a culture war, or as the Germans call it, Kulturkampf, mm -hmm. not a, 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 a war with weapons. Ова uh, што го предходно разговаравме околу реакцијата на христијаните, се појавија некои информации дека uh, Русија се обидува сега да одговори на овие процеси и веќе има испратено своји специјални сили во на Балканот особено, во Босна и така натаму. Дали мислите дека ако Европа нема сили да се опре, да се спротивстави на ова тивка инвазија, која на моменти е доста агресивна, русите ќе успеат. Russians have no presence in Europe. They can send maybe this unit or that unit, commando unit, that unit, train, some training, some... but they don't have presence in Europe. They don't have the... And you can't fight this invasion with the airplanes. You can't fight it with weapons. The last war with Muslims was in Bosnia in 1995, and it did not end well for the Christians. <laughs> so you can't fight, fight it with weapons. This is not an invasion in the classical sense. This is Kulturkampf. You can fight it only with culture. You can hope to convert the Muslims that are coming here into the dominant values of liberalism, progressivism, civiliza Western civilization. You can hope. It is not very likely to succeed. Because Muslims come into Europe with their own variant of dominant political theory, which is the Uba, mm -hmm. with their own perception of legal theory and legal doctrine, which is Sharia. They are, they compete, Muslims compete with Christian for the space of values. They compete with Christian for the minds of people. The war is here, not in the ground. No Russian can help you. It's a war of minds, war of cultures, war of civilizations. And it is, it is managed much more cleverly than before. I think I'm interested in an economic question. Before it is appointed, the price of the oil on the world's bergs is moving from 100 to 120-130 dollars. When the oil is taken away, нафтата на светските пазари падна на 20-25 долари. Како го објаснувате тој феномен? No, this is not to do with ISIS. This is because uh, in the last three years, the last five years, I'm sorry, the United States became net, net exporter of energy. The United States now produces as much oil as Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. It's a huge oil producer. Second, Russia. Russia became bigger. Значи вие објаснувате дека поради големо производство и голема понуда цената падна. Yes, even Israel, even Israel is now oil producer and while Israel used to import oil, now Israel is exporting oil. So Israel is exporting oil was imported. America is exporting oil was imported. Russia is exporting oil, Russia was imported until 1980 something. So suddenly Canada is an exporter of oil. Suddenly, there are new sources of uh, of exports of oil. So, да, но науката што е што ги изучува тие феномени на богатството од земјината топка вела дека резервите на нафта се ограничени, не се неограничени. Ако со таков голем интензитет се произведува нафта и се нуди на светскиот пазар, 
da za mnogo kratko vreme će se istrpi. Toga što pravime? Well, we have two answers for that. First of all, what you say is called the peak oil hypothesis. Peak oil hypothesis means that soon we will run out of oil. But the peak oil hypothesis is based on certain economic assumptions, for example, on a certain oil price. There is a lot of oil. There is oil for the next hundreds of years. But it's very expensive oil to produce. If the oil price remains high, then you have enough oil for the next three, four hundred years. If the oil price goes down dramatically, the oil that is in the ground is expensive to take out. Mm -hmm. So it's not worth it. Okay. Then we have a problem. Second answer to your question is that alternative energy today is very, very efficient, much more efficient than it used to be. Alternative energy, solar energy, mm -hmm. wind energy, mm -hmm. and so on. There are already 12 countries in the world which get all their energy needs not from oil. Mm -hmm. Even one of your neighbors, Netherlands, in the Netherlands, more than two-thirds of all the energy needs are not coming from oil. They are coming from wind, mostly, and wave, and so on. Wind and uh, veteri sonce. Sve maku globalna politika. Американскиот државен секретар Джим Кери не одам на изјави дека овој регион на Балканот, Србија, Македонија, Босна, се наоѓаат на линија на фронт. Тој мисли дека тоа е фронтот што е воспоставен на а, каде што се судираат интересите на источниот и западниот блок, Северноатлантскиот пакт и Русија. Дали мислите дека ќе успе Америка да го реализира планот што Збигнијев Бжежински го напиша во неговата книга Големата шаховска табла да се направи еден исчекор до Каспискиот базен преку Балканскиот полуостров? I think since America became net oil producer, it has lost interest in Europe completely. You see, for example, Obama says that the main interests of the United States are in the Pacific, and he calls it the Pacific pivot. Obama dedicates much more time to China, Asia, Africa even, than to Europe. Obama visit, visited the Africa three times. He visited Asia more than 30 times. No, because of that, no. It's because Africa is definitely the continent of the future. Africa in 50 years will be richer than Europe. So it's economic interest. But he visited Asia 30 times. Obama visited uh, Europe three or four times, and all four times he came to Congress, to some conference, mm -hmm. G7, G20, and so on. He never visited Europe for, for a visit. So look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a presidential candidate. What is he talking about? He's talking about dismantling NATO. He's talking about letting the Europeans cope with Russia by themselves. He's talking about withdrawing from Europe. He represents the popular sentiment in the United States. But not only the popular sentiment, he represents the scholarly academic thinking. Academics in the United States today believe that Europe has become irrelevant. It's relevant as a trading partner, but no longer relevant geopolitically. Trump, what is your for Republicanci. Trump succeeded to do the unthinkable. He, there is a, a very big group in the United States. The United States is a very interesting country. It is 10% highly educated, well-traveled, cosmopolitan, literate, elite people, and 90% human garbage. <laughs> that illiterate people uneducated, ignorant, never saw the world, never saw anything except their own state, uh, stupid, and so on. This is the composition of the United States. Now, normally, in normal elections in the United States, about 37% of the population on average voted. 63% of the population of the United States never voted in, in presidential elections. Never. Only 37%, which represented essentially the elite and some of the middle class, upper middle class. Voting was restricted to people who had property and people who were educated. Donald Trump succeeded to revolutionize the presidential race in the United States, not for the first time, but he succeeded. 
he took out of the woods about 10 million people who never voted before, ever, in their lives. These people are called in the United States white trash. White trash. Bikers with tattoos, you know, this kind of people. <laughs> 10 million of them came out of the wood. And suddenly, they realized he taught them that they have power. Mm -hmm. He empowered them. Add to that another 10 or maybe 20 million people who lost their jobs, are afraid for the future, don't have savings, uh, lost their families, uh, have high school education, so they're not very competitive, and so on. This is the middle class that used to be middle class and now is poor because of the economic crisis in the United States. This is a total of 25, 30 million people. This is his support base. Now the problem is that many of these people of the second group, the first group never voted, the second group, many of these people used to vote Democratic. Mm -hmm. They used to be Democrats. So he succeeded to convert many Democrats to become Trump, Trumpists, Trumpist. not Republican. <laughs> He's not Republican. He's not Republican. He's Trumpist. They became Trumpists. This is not the first time it's happening in American history. It happened before several times with similar people, people similar to Trump. There is a serious risk that he will win the elections if this continues like that. But you, uh, let me go to the question, Кој е вашата прогноза републиканци или демократи? Кој ќе бидат победи? I think ultimately the Democrats will win. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately. Да. Како ја толкувате одлуката на судот во Хак? Радован Караджич го ставија во затвор, а Шешелј го ослободија. На што се должи тоа? Караджич was involved day to day in military decisions. He gave direct orders. These orders are recorded in by voice, by, by paper. He acted stupidly. He was not only political inspiration and political leader, but he was active military commander on the field. <laughs> you, you have numerous footage, numerous videos of Karadzic in this war, in this battle, in this battle, commanding the officers and so on and so forth. He got... Sheshe? Sheshe was more political figure. He was more inspiration, more protected by free speech, more in the values. Dali se soglasuvate s otvrdenjeto deka posle веста дека во нови сат е формирана руска политичка партија, Европската унија веднаш на Србија и даде кандидатски статус, а хак го ослободи Шешеј. No, I don't think. This, I don't, this conspiracy theories. Хак is not subject to political pressure at all. Most of the, most of the judges in Хак are actually from Africa, Asia, uh, Middle East and so on. They are not... They're not even Europeans. Значи вие него делите мислењето дека судот во Хак е политички туку е is not political at all. Mm -hmm. It's the prosecution is political. Да. Uh, the prosecution of the of the European uh, the, the prosecuti prosecutory arm the prosecutors are political. Mm -hmm. That is why you have so many Serbs and almost no Croats, almost no Bosniaks because the prosecution is politicized. Uh -huh. But once it gets to the court, the court is not politicized. If the court had many Croats, many Croats would be in jail. <laughs> but no Croats came to the court because the prosecution was politicized. Yeah, yeah. Sada da se prefalime malo na našiov domaćen makedonski teren, zato što potrošivamo dosta vreme vo od emisijata vo opštite temi. Vi živete dolgo vreme vo Makedonije i gi poznavate prilikite vo Makedonija. Кога и дали мнозинството албанци во Македонија ќе престанат да сонуваат за Илирида и Голема Албанија? Во неделата на 10-ти овој месец на стадионот во Тетово, Шкендија, Ренова, повторно извици Илирида, USA, United States of Albania и така натаму. Што мислите за таа работа? I think that among Macedonians there are some Macedonians who talk about greater Macedonia with parts from Greece, parts from Bulgaria, parts from even from Albania. So you have, uh, you have uh, radical fringe people in every nation. You have Macedonians talking about Great Macedonia, Albanians about Great Albania, and you have Greeks talking about Greater Greece. So it's, uh, but this is definitely not the mindset and not the, the value system of the majority of Albanians. Uh. Веројатно ви е познат рамкомиот договор од 2001 година. Дали мислите дека тој ќе успее да ги реши сите проблеми во Македонија или 
ne vada uspjeh. So, things have changed in Macedonia in, uh, in the past few years. When you signed the, the framework agreement, you had a unitary state. You don't have it anymore. You had some functioning institutions. Most of these institutions have been subverted. They're no longer functioning. The state doesn't have the capacity to impose its will on, on its citizens. And most importantly, you have become a protectorate. You're no longer a state. There has been a putsch, a coup, by foreigners. Foreigners took over your state. The European Union is not a secret. The foreigners reached... Uh, the, American countries? No, the Americans are not interested in Europe, let alone Macedonia. The, the foreigners reached the conclusion that you are not sufficiently mature or knowledgeable to have your own country. <laughs> you need time. You need time to grow up from children to adults. And you need time to learn how to do things. How to run a country, running a country and having a state is the outcome of, century, of, of uh, tradition. Traditions, these traditions take decades or even centuries. So it's not an easy thing uh, to do. And uh, Macedonia as a republic within Yugoslavia was always dependent. Economically, it was dependent on transfers from Belgrade. Politically, it was dependent. Before that, there was no Macedonian state as a precursor. So you don't have experience. Do you think that after 25 years of independence, they don't have to learn some work? No. It's a very short period? Yes, because, look, when the state of Israel was established, we had five states before that. The state of Israel is number six. We had 2,000 years experience. When, when the United States was established, it was established by people who came from countries which existed for 1,000 years. We have very few countries in, in the world which were established by people who had no previous experience in running the affairs of state, mm -hmm. like Macedonians. So most of these countries are in, in Africa. Дали ова дијагноза што ја дадовте за Македонија е објаснување за што не може да се реши прашањето за името што го наметнува Грција? No, this has to do more, more with Greece than with you. This has to do with internal considerations in Greece and internal political considerations and with uh, Greece, a Greek game of uh, chess, geopolitical chess, which Macedonia is a victim of. I'm talking about internal affairs, not external affairs. Mm -hmm. Internally, you failed. As a state, you failed. And the foreigners had to take over and convert you into a protectorate. Now, once the foreigners converted you into a protectorate, in, a, in the equivalent of a putsch, of a coup, the, there is a divergence of interest between Albanians and Macedonians. You are no longer going the same way. You no longer have the same visions, the same goals. You no longer have anything in common, in effect. You used to have the institutions of state in common, but now there's no state and no institutions. <coughs> Сега ми давате шлагборд за следново прашање. Сите држави што успеале да направат од себе држави, успеале да го направат тоа со некои интегративни процеси, каде што луѓето наоѓаат некои заеднички интереси, заеднички желби и заедно го остваруваат тоа. Дефиницијата дека немаме со албанците заеднички цели, немаме заеднички желби, немаме заеднички интереси, тие водат код кон дезинтеграција. Кој би бил начинот за да се создаде еден интегрум, нешто што ќе ги спои тие заедници што се во Македонија, не само македонски албанци, туку и другите? First of all, you already disintegrated. You do not have a unitary state. You have two political units that call themselves right now Macedonia. But these are two totally separate units. In the unit which comp where the Albanians are the majority, the institutions of a state don't have big presence. And they have their own institutions, which they are creating right now. This part of Macedonia, western part, is much more connected, for example, to Kosovo than it is to Macedonia. Its leaders come from Kosovo. Its inspiration comes from Kosovo. Ideology comes from Kosovo. Intermarriage, movement of Kosovars. 
there is an assumption that several tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people in that region actually came from Kosovo. So it's much more Kosovo than Macedonian. It's technically in Macedonia, but your country broke apart already. It broke apart because you failed, both, of, both ethnicities failed to find a common vision, common ethos, common direction, common goals, common hopes, common dreams. You failed in that. Now, and in this sense, you are like Israel with the Arabs inside Israel. There was a failure there. But Israel is a strong country, rich country, powerful country with military and so on. So it's holding itself together by violence. You can't hold yourself by violence. You can't hold yourself by common institutions. You can't hold yourself by common dreams. Only thing that is holding Macedonia together right now are foreigners. Physical presence of foreigners, <coughs> threats, threats by foreigners, and hopes to join the foreigners. You hope to join the EU. You hope to join NATO. You hope to join the foreigners. So you have dreams of joining the foreigners. You have physical foreigners here which are running your country, like Protectorat. And you have threats. Anytime you go left or right, the foreigners are threatening you. We will do this to you, we will do that to you. You will not no, be... No, you didn't answer the question. Do you have any proposal koji merki treba во Македонија да се спроведат за да се луѓето од различните етникуми соберат кон заеднички вредности, заеднички цели. You don't have. Да, но дали No, што, you што, can't. No, што you можеме don't. да најдеме No, you can't. Заедничко? You can't do anything. You are different people. You don't have common values, common dreams, common history, common you have nothing in common. You have absolutely nothing in common. It's the same situation in Israel. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict will never, ever, ever, never be solved. Ever. In the year 3000, you and I will have interview here. And they will still be fighting in Palestine. It's the same situation in Macedonia. Macedonia is a result of artificial borders imposed essentially in Yugoslavia. These borders include a sizable ethnic minority which has nothing, absolutely nothing, in common with the ethnic majority. Macedonia, historical Macedonia, was broken up and big pieces were taken by other countries, like Bulgaria, like Greece. In those areas, Macedonia, there were Macedonian majorities, but those areas are gone. And now what you're left with, you are left with a part of your country where Macedonians are afraid to go, where the police is afraid to go, where the Uyapes is afraid to go. This is an independent, autonomous region. Добро. Ме интересира сега дали можеме да се осврнеме на последните афери. Што мислите за Панама Papers? The, the political elites in the world, ever since the Second World War, the communist political elite, the nomenclatura, the capitalist political elite, political elites in the world have divorced the people. There was a divorce between people and political elites. Political elites feel that they are not vulnerable, they can do anything they want, they can steal as much as they want. And it is true in Macedonia, and it is true in, in Iceland, and it is true in the United States, and it is true in Sweden, and it is true in India. And yeah. it is true in Africa. It is a major crisis of politics all over the world. Because there is this major crisis of politics, people like Trump can threaten the presidency. Because political establishment all over the world is finished. There is no trust in politics. And because there is no trust in politics, all the systems which give rise to politicians, like democracy, are questioned. People not only lost trust in politicians, they lost trust in the system that creates politicians, like democracy. So we have authoritarian, far-right, fascistic movements suddenly coming up again. We have demagogues like Donald Trump. Yeah. We have dictators like Putin. <clears throat> democracy is good only as long as there is a true, real connection, emotional connection, historical connection, cultural connection, and connection of values between leaders and led, between politicians and the people. 
But when the politicians disconnect from the people, when they hold the people in contempt, Brazil, you know, and when they regard the state as their own property, then you have a crisis that will destroy completely all the political system. Да, но ова што ова дефиниција односно дијагноза што сега ја дадовте е случај во мнозинство земји во светот. Политичарите се одвоени од народот. Yes. И она што го приграбиле од народот сака да го сместат на сигурни места. Yes, не не само сака, they build systems. Politicians build systems. Аха. In, intentionally build systems with specific laws, with specific accounting firms with specific legal firms with specific places to, to hide the money се сеќавам на изјавата на лидерот на опозицијата Зоран Заев кога го обвини Груевски дека украл од буџетот од негде 5 милијарди долари пари дека тие пари ќе ги врати дали постојат во државите системи да се тие пари од политичарите што ги украли од народот вратат повторно на народот yes there is a concept in international law, it's called odious, odious money. If the people, the nation, the state, can prove that money that is in the account of a leader, ex-political leader and so on, belongs to the state, this money is returned by the banking system to the state. Mm -hmm. It's a common, common practice in international law. No. But I doubt very much that uh, Nikola Gwirski could have stolen five billion dollars if you take into account that the entire budget of Macedonia is 2 billion, so it's a, a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> за, за 10 години, не за... Ah, 10 години, okay. Да. Имате ли ваше мислење кој го креираше прислушувањето во Македонија и кој му ги даде на заед бомбите што ги пласираше во јавността за да ја дестабилизира Македонија? I think the Americans did. Американците го направија тоа? I think the Americans gave the information to Zayf. I think so. Mm -hmm. Дали мислите дека изборите на 5 јуни ќе бидат можни или не? Техникали да ќе бидат елекшн. Но ако опозиција бойкотат за елекшн, ќе 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 � the most important institutions in the country are the parliament. The most important process is elections. If parliament and elections are not functioning, what else is functioning? The source of authority is the state. <coughs> Judicial part operates under this, under parliament. Judiciary, the courts, only implement the laws that are passed by parliament, and parliament has to be legitimate to pass laws. If parliament loses its legitimacy, because of a dysfunctional election process. Where is the source of legitimacy of the state coming from? No, so you have a not legitimate state, state, illegitimate state. So even individuals are saying, this state is not legitimate. I don't recognize it, I will not pay taxes. So you have civic disobedience, civic revolt. After that you have civic unrest. And in some cases you have civil war. Mm -hmm. It's a process that is very bad. Да се вратиме сега на крај при крајот на емисијава со едни две прашања кои излегуваат надбор од нашиот регион овде. Што ще се случува на светските берзи? Прочитав негде дека шпекулативниот капитал што го имаат тајкуните да господно Сорош и компанија се обидуваат преку светските берзи да дестабилизираат одредени земји. Дали е тоа точно или е теорија на заговор? Not fully, no. It's not fully conspiracy theory. People like uh, Soros, who are public billionaires, billionaires who have public goals, definitely consider certain regimes to be illegitimate regimes and definitely contribute money to destabilize these regimes and change them. Mm -hmm. So it's not conspiracy theory. But the vast majority of billionaires, and there are many more billionaires in China than in the United States, by the way. China today is the richer uh, rich people concentrate in China, not in the United States. But the vast majority of billionaires in the world today are different to the billionaires of the 19th century and different to the billionaires of the 20th century. Why? In the 19th century and the 20th century, when you were a billionaire, you took your money and you invested it in the economy. You built railroads, you yeah. made factories. Yeah. You. Today's billionaires don't invest their money. 
they accumulate the money. So koja cel gi čuva, to je mrtov kapital. They don't invest the money, it's a fact. The vast majority of money accumulated by the rich people is not reinvested. It is kept in hedge funds. In The reason is that the financial sector gives you much better income than the real sector. Mm -hmm. If I put $100 in stocks or $100 in factory, I will make much more money in the stock exchange than in factory. Da, no, na berza može i lesno da se zaraboti, no i lesno da se zagubi. Yes, but uh, the, they make money also in the losses. They are instruments to make, financial instruments, to allow you to make money when the stock exchange is going down. It's called shorts. Mm -hmm. So the hist uh, analysis shows that rich people never lose money in effect. Even when the stock exchange is going down, they make money. Companies, no. Companies can lose money. But the rich people. Now, the problem is this. 50 years ago, the richest 1% controlled 47% of the money in the world. The richest 1% controlled 47%, which is enormous. Today, the richest 1% control 91% of the money. Oh, oh. Yes. That means 90% of the money was taken out of the economy. Out of the economy. And put into financial assets. Consequently, Financial assets are growing all the time. Stocks are growing, you know, all the time. But the real economy is not good. People don't have jobs. And if they have jobs, they have no salaries and so on. If the real economy is not in a good condition, if there is no work, then there will be a lot of social damage. What do you have? You don't have social damage? Show me one country without social damage. You have social unrest everywhere. Do you know that the salaries of, of uh, average people, the salaries of average people in the United States did not go up even by one dollar since 1970. Salary of average American is the same today like 1970. But income of rich Americans between 1970 and today went up six times, 600%. It is creating tension, big tension. I would say almost communist almost leading to communism, mm. you know, proletariat. There yeah. is big proletariat. It's the first time since the 1920s that there is a big proletariat, real proletariat. Do you know what is the average savings in the bank of an American family? Yes, no. You cannot imagine. $500. American family, average American family of middle class has $500 cash in the bank. $500. This creates a, a tension, enormous, this is time bomb, enormous time bomb. Mm -hmm. The stupid rich people accumulate their money and speculate with it, increasing the stock exchange to the sky, not connected to reality at all, and refuse to invest money in small businesses, in factories, in, in infrastructure. Did you see, did you visit the United States? Everything is falling apart. Infrastructure like Africa. Ako Е, ваква една диагноза и прогнозите се од црно по црно до каде ќе стаса светот? We are on the verge of the biggest economic political crisis ever. I have been saying it for three, four years now. Да, меѓутоа таа криза некаде ќе мора да експлодира. Yes, it's about. Кој прави? We are now, now. Сега сме во експлозија. Now, 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 now. Maybe next show that we do together, we will be discussing the explosion. Now it's about to explode. It's about to explode in the United States, as you are seeing. It's about to explode in Europe. It's, we are on the verge of apocalypse, in effect. Economic, political apocalypse. Geopolitical. Not so, not so slow. Yes, I think. I'm not using apocalypse in the religious sense. But I'm talking about total disintegration and collapse of systems that we built for decades and sometimes centuries of capitalism itself. Ако тие системи колабираат новите, кои ќе бидат нови што ќе можат да го држат светот во некоја равнотежа. But this is exactly what happened in the 5th century. Barbarians attacked Rome. Rome collapsed. Institutions collapsed. Да. System collapsed. And we had Uh, values. 
Терминов за емисијава помина, многу е незгодно да ја завршиме со овакви црни прогнози. Дајте за крај да кажеме нешто по-оптимистичко и по-светло. Прочитав неодамна дека пристаништето во Пиреја е продадено на некоја кинеска компанија. Кој е дали... две, две, две години. Дали тоа значи дека жолтата раса ќе надладе на крајот? In the last 5,000 years, China was the dominant superpower 4,000 years. The West was dominant 500 years. Mm -hmm. The standard in human history is for China to be the superpower. These 500 years are accident, aberration. When the West was on top, da. that's an aberration. <laughs> Почтувани гледачи, ова беше разговорот со нашиот и ваш пријател Сем Вакнин. Со него кога човек разговара, може и со денови и со ноќи и секогаш ќе чуете нешто драматично. Вакнин ви благодарам на ова интервју. Thank you for having me. Се надевам дека во некоја следна прилика ќе бидеме пооптимистички за нашиот гледач. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Absolutely. Ова беше значи интервјуто на телевизија Сонце со господинот Сем Вакнин. Ако некои Не ја гледале оваа емисија, а ќе им пренесете дека била интересна, кажете им дека репризата ќе биде во вторник во, 20, во 21 часот. Тоа беше се почитувани гледачи за вечера, доведување и пријатно. Thank you.